let everyone in. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Tech Tuesday. We are going to be talking about cybersecurity. Um, my name is Vanessa. I'm an ITS communications specialist. And today we have Ali Smith, who's our security and identity services manager. We also have Brian Schinkel, who's our chief information security officer. And while he's not um, taking the lead with presenting today, he may decide to answer a couple of your questions um, that you have in the Q&A. Uh, for those of us who are joining us, we are recording today's session. So if you want to go back and review anything that we discussed today, we'll be sending a follow-up email with a link to the recording, as well as any other relevant links that may be helpful uh, for offering cybersecurity tips. There's also a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions at any point during the session, feel free to just pop them in there. We'll be stopping periodically to answer your questions and might be answering them in the Q&A chat as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Allie. Allie, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Vanessa. Um, so like Vanessa mentioned, my name is Allie or Alexandra Smith, and I'm the Security and Identity Services Manager here at Wall Cornell. So most of my role is going over our services, products, and processes and seeing where there's gaps or if there's any feedback, how we can incorporate it. Some of you guys may have been to a Tech Tuesday I've done before, or I may have met some of you at Smart Fest. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys again today. Um, so today I'll be going over email security and social engineering scams. So what are we going to be learning today? So we're going to learn about why cybersecurity is important, and we're going to go through um, the IC3's annual report and also how email security works here at Wall Cornell. Then we're also going to go over how you guys can use email securely and also some other ways that uh, hackers can steal your credentials. And then lastly, I have my contact information, a few um, links that I'll also be shared with you guys after the meeting for more help or if you have any other questions. All right. So first off, why is cybersecurity important? I think a lot of us know how important it is given that we've transitioned from remote work and with COVID, there's been a lot of more things online. But the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center, or IC3, releases an annual report um, about what complaints they get each year. So over the last five years, over 3 million complaints were received, totaling close to 30 billion in losses. So they average about 652,000 complaints annually. And this particular year in 2022, they had 800,944 complaints and $10.3 billion were lost. So over 2.7 billion of these losses in 2022 were due to business email compromise. Um, and there has been a spike in cryptocurrency schemes. So the scheme used to be simple hacking or spoofing of business and personal email accounts where they would request uh, for you to send a wire payment to fraudulent bank accounts. Um, they involved compromised vendor emails, requests for W-2 information, and they typically targeted the real estate sector or asked for a large amount of gift cards. More recently, though, they're getting a bit more sophisticated and they're utilizing custodial accounts at financial institutions for cryptocurrency exchanges, or they're even having people send cryptocurrency, send cryptocurrency directly to cryptocurrency platforms where the funds are quickly dispersed. So these scams can range anywhere from um, them hacking a social media account and impersonating one of your friends trying to get you interested in cryptocurrency. They sometimes create fake accounts to impersonate celebrities and form a friendship with their victims to try to entice them to invest in cryptocurrency. Or they engage in liquidity mining, which is when victims are enticed to link their cryptocurrency wallet to a fraudulent, fraudulent liquidity mining application. And then after it's linked, the scammers wipe out the victim's funds without notification or permission from the victim. As I mentioned too, they target real estate professionals a lot. So they do contact a real estate agent, usually offering to buy a very expensive property for cash or cryptocurrency. And then once they're engaged with that real estate agent, they um, expose their control of fictitious accounts with values of millions of dollars to entice uh, the real estate agents to engage in their investment scheme. Lastly, another common cryptocurrency scheme that we see is an employment scheme. So hackers put a fake employment opportunity online, someone applies, and then instead of receiving a job offer or interview, the victim is instead offered advice on investing. And then the hacker hopes that um, the 
victim is so enticed by the investment that they invest cryptocurrency into uh, the fake investment. So investment bank account scams resulted in over 3 billion losses, which is a 127% increase from 2021. So like I mentioned, cryptocurrency investment rose a lot. And through those uh, schemes I mentioned earlier, people lost $2.57 billion. Most of the victims targeted were between 30 to 49 years of age. Phishing still remains the number one um, cybercrime that's reported to the IC3. So over 300,000 people fell victim to all sorts of uh, phishing, phishing from email, phishing, which is voice phishing, smishing, which is SMS text phishing, or farming via websites. And over 1 billion was lost due to fake call center schemes. So people or so hackers pretended to be government or tech support to try to entice victims to hand over information by acting as a trusted entity. Healthcare and public health, so the sector we fall in, still continues to be the highest victimized by ransomware. And also New York State ranked number four in number of victims and in number three in amount of loss. So working and residing um, in New York State, since we all work or go to school at Wall Cornell, means it's really important to watch out for all of these different crimes, given um, how high New York ranks and also the sector that we're in. So diving a little deeper into the top five crimes uh, that were reported in 2022. So as I mentioned before, phishing still remains um, at the highest. It's gone down a little bit since 2021, but not by much. Uh, then it's followed by personal data breaches. So that would be a leak or spill of personal data um, or a security incident where an individual's sensitive, protected, or confidential data is copied, transmitted, viewed, stolen by an unauthorized entity. And then uh, the third most common was non-payment or non-delivery. So this is when goods or services are shipped, but payment is never rendered, or when a payment's sent, but the goods or services never come, or they're of lesser quality than described. Um, the fourth most common uh, crime that was seen, cyber crime that was seen last year was extortion. So that's the unlawful extraction of money or property through intimidation or undue ex exercise of authority. So it might include uh, threats of physical harm, criminal prosecution or public exposure. And the last crime in the top five was tech support. So although this is a lot lower um, than the phishing category by quite a bit, it's still concerning to note that it's, it has been on the rise consistently since 2019. So the tech support crimes are when um, the hacker poses as someone in technical or customer support and they ask you to confirm information, give you credentials, or they try to get you to download certain software to assist with the support process. So going a little further into this call center fraud. So over 2022, there were 11,554 victims due to fraud of government, government impersonation, and then 32,538 uh, due to tech and customer support. So this totaled over 44,000 people and totaled more than a billion in losses. And as you can see on the right, they did target and people did fall for in every age range. However, the over 60 crowd was larger by far, mostly due to a lot of these scams impersonating Medicare or social security numbers. So typically they would go after the over 60 population since that's a little bit more relevant to them than the rest of the population. So I've talked about kind of where cybercrime is overall in the past um, year, but here at Wall Cornell, email security is definitely something uh, that we focus on because we have a lot of phishing attempts daily. So over 90 days, we receive about 27 million emails and less than half of that email actually gets to all of your inboxes. And this is thanks to our Proofpoint detection software. So Proofpoint identifies malicious emails and blocks them. About 56% of our emails are known threats and blocked by Proofpoint. And then targeted threats are a lot lower at a little less than 1%, but still a good amount of email. So Proofpoint blocks uh, these emails based on a few different things. 5 million emails were blocked due to reputations. So this is a known bad IP address. 10 million were blocked due to content. So this would be bad signatures, spam or bulk emails, or impersonation messages. Basically, if someone tried to impersonate Dean Choi and tried to email all of us, this would be blocked by Proofpoint. Uh, the, in the targeted threats category, Proofpoint also blocked 6,000 emails that had malicious attachments and then 32,000 that had malicious links. So out of all the emails sent to us, only about 12 million emails actually gets through. So that's less than half. 
And then there are a small, small amount of malicious messages that do get delivered that circumvent proof point, given that their content attachments or sender don't stick out as malicious. But then through our security analyst due diligence and also reports from all of you, we identify these emails and pull them from inboxes to prevent um, the emails from going further. So compared uh, to industry means and academic and, med and medical centers um, and higher education, we're pretty par for the course with what kind of threats we get. We're a little bit less in phishing, but then a little bit more in um, other threats such as banking, but we're pretty aligned with the rest of the industry means as to what kind of threats target our users. On the right is our results from the phishing campaigns that my team runs. So these are emails that we send out to all of you. You may have noticed that when you click report to um, ITS security, you might get a little message telling you that this was just all part of an exercise that we've been conducting to make sure that people are looking out for fishes. So we track the metrics of these campaigns. And the big thing we focus on is how many people report it to us versus how many people click, because this results in our resiliency rate. So as you can see, even though our resiliency rate is mostly over one, it's not really up to par with the healthcare and education sector. So typically other healthcare and education industries have users reporting um, a bit more than they're clicking than we do. We, we did have um, a good month in August where a lot of people reported, but we definitely wanna try to get this number up a little bit. And we do keep track of who reports um, to us these uh, phishing emails so we can include these in our metrics and see how we're doing. So that's kind of about what we do to keep you guys safe with email, but there's a few things that you guys can do as well. So I think a lot of you have heard about phishing, but a quick uh, history of how phishing started. So the actual term wasn't used um, in this presentation, but there was a paper and presentation to the International HP Users Group in 1987 that detailed what a phishing technique would actually be. And then the first time mention of the actual term phishing was in 1996 uh, when the hacking tool AOL was used by a lot of well-known hackers and spammers. So phishing attempts started out with hackers stealing passwords and creating random credit card numbers. And they weren't super successful at first, but they made enough money to keep doing what they were doing and keep at um, trying to fish users. So they would open fake AOL accounts with random credit card numbers and use those accounts to spam other users. And AOL was a Windows application that made the process a lot more automated. And this was actually released a year before the term phishing was coined. Um, AOL put security measures in place to prevent this practice. And they shut down AOL later in the year, but the floodgates were already opened. So phishers then moved on to create a different type of phishing attack using a lot of the techniques we still see today. So they started sending messages to users with AOL email or instant messenger systems, posing as AOL employees, asking for uh, passwords, for personal information, et cetera. And since phishing had never really been done before, people willingly gave their information because they thought, hey, it's coming from an AOL system, from an AOL employee, I trust them, I'm gonna give them my information. So this was happening a lot, and then AOL actually shut down all of these accounts to try to stop it from happening, but as I mentioned with AOL opening the floodgates, this also opened the floodgates to other phishing scams. So in 2001, phishers began exploiting online payment systems and the first attack was on eGold in June 2001. So since then, phishers have um, gone after all different kinds of people at all different organizations after starting out um, primarily using AOL. So what are phishing emails? I think a lot of us have heard about phishing emails given their prevalence and how a lot of things are online now, but phishing emails are sent by scammers to try to trick you into giving them information or doing something. So whether they want to have you give them your credentials or open an attachment to download malware on your computer, this only works if you react to what they're sending you. So these emails have three pretty common elements. Uh, what is a call to action? As I mentioned, they need you to do something in order to succeed. So they want you to download something, click a link, reply to them or contact someone else to get information or send them your own information. They also use emotion or urgency. So they want you to act quickly without thinking. So they try to make things appear urgent with a really good deal or someone's in trouble to get you to do something you wouldn't normally if you had time to think. And they use different emotions to do this like fear, curiosity, greed, or compassion. Lastly, all of these emails have malicious intent. These hackers want to cause harm. They either want to steal your personal information 
to create bogus accounts or use it against you, or they want to download malware on your computer so they can take it hostage and have you um, pay money in order to get it back. So all of these emails intend to cause harm. There is a specific type of phishing called spear phishing. A lot of phishing attempts are broad and very generic, but spear phishing focuses on certain people or groups of people. Therefore, they're a little bit more specific, so they're a little bit more difficult to spot. For example, a spear phishing attempt on Wall Cornell might try to impersonate another Wall Cornell employee or even try to impersonate us, the IT department, in order to get people to uh, be more likely to fall for the fish. So there's a few different things you can do to protect yourself from phishing attacks. So play, pay close attention to the different parts of the email. So when you look at the sender details, see who sent you the email. Does it make sense for you to receive that email? Are they using a free email address? All of these are things to consider before responding or taking action when you receive an email. You should also exercise caution with any email that contains the external tag. Our affiliates, MIP, Columbia, MSKCC, and HSS and Rockefeller don't get tagged as external. So if someone posing from that organization sends you an email and you see the external tag, that's a little bit of a red flag, especially if you weren't expecting the email. Also, beware of emails that promise rewards for little to no effort or seem good, too good to be true. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Evaluate the tone and language of the email to see if it matches the sender. So think about the purpose of the email when you receive it. Look at the content. Is the greeting generic, but it's from a colleague that you work with a lot? That's a red flag that it might actually be a phishing email. Also, when you look at the content of the email, hover over the link to see if the link in the email is actually taking you to the U taking you to the URL that it displays. Here at Wall Cornell, we have Proofpoint uh, that does mask links. So this is a little bit more helpful with your personal email. But one thing you can use for both personal and Wall Cornell email is if you get an email from someone asking you to click on a link, instead of just go directly to the link. For example, if you get an email from Citibank saying you need to update your account, just go straight to Citibank's website instead of clicking on the actual link sent in the email. Last but certainly not least, Report any suspicious emails that you receive to us using the fish alarm button. You can see I actually have a little um, <laughs> advertisement for the fish alarm button here, but if you report this, then we can take a look at the email to make sure that it's safe. And do not click any links or open any of the attachments until you hear from us on whether or not the email is safe. So some phishing examples can be pretty easy to spot. This is uh, the, my favorite phishing email I've ever received. So just, there's so many things in this email that you can tell this is not a real email. First of all, unfortunately, I do not know Dr. Jill Biden. So it would be kind of weird that she would be sending me an email. Also $25 million is a ton of money and all they want is my home address. That's kind of odd that they would give me that much money just for that information. Also, it's from a free email address, run on sentence, a lot of grammatical errors. So it, it's pretty easy to tell that this one's a fish but not all phishing attacks are really that easy to spot. So this is a real phishing email uh, with someone pretending to be the IRS. At a first glance, it looks pretty legitimate. They have the signature, they have the branding. Uh, there's no real spelling or grammatical errors. So it's very difficult to point out why this is a fish. So some of the things that you could pick out of these email, but again, you would need to look closely is they're using a free email address that doesn't really match the sender. Um, they're offering you a lot of money for no real action on your part. And also they're trying to scare you by saying that deliberate wrong inputs will be crimin criminally pursued and indicated. So they're trying to get you to react without thinking both from having this awesome prize of getting money back and also threatening to, um, threatening to perform actions against you if you don't actually put in the right information. So like I mentioned, you can use Fish Alarm to contact us if you see any suspicious emails, anything that you think might be phishing. So it's a tool in Outlook that allows you to select an email and report it to us. These emails are then routed to our Proofpoint threat detection software. And Proofpoint, as I mentioned earlier, can normally categorize malicious emails and block them. But if it doesn't, they have additional filters that can go through the email to make sure um, to determine whether it's malicious or not. If Proofpoint um, can't do the analysis, then a security analyst will review the email and follow up with you on the threat level of the email. So we do have a manual intervention if needed. And as I mentioned before, don't click anything, don't reply, don't open anything until you hear from us that the email is safe. So over here, um, you can see where the fish alarm button might be located based on what you're using. 
if you're using Outlook on the web versus the desktop client, and depending on what OS you're using, Mac versus Windows versus iPhone versus Android, the button might be in different places, and it might also it might also say different things. So it might say report email IT security, or it might say report fish. But in general, the button looks like a little email with a little alert sign there, a little phishing hook. Um, if you don't see the button at all, you may need to pin it to your Outlook ribbon, and we do have a KB on that um, that can be sent out later uh, in the resources. So as I mentioned, um, we do have some things in place to protect your email security. So one is our data loss prevention system. So this system looks at emails to make sure that no confidential information is getting sent out unencrypted. So it would look for match conditions. And a match condition is three identifiers of personal information when matched to one person. For example, uh, your medical record number, your first name, and your last name would be a match condition that would be personal information that we don't want sent out. So in the context of medical records, think of each match as an individual patient. So there's two scenarios where our DLP system comes into play. One is if unencrypted email with any text that looks like it might be an MRN or social security number and includes a medical keyword, such as lab, cancer, or anything like that. That will go to our DLP system. And um, if there's not an exact match, so if that social security number MRN doesn't, if the email doesn't also have a first name, last name, birthday, or any other qualifiers, then the email will go out as sent. If it does, it will go back to the recipient um, in order to correct uh, what information was being sent out. The second scenario is if the unencrypted email has an MRN or SSN, a known one, without an accompanying medical keyword. So if we have a medical record number here at Wall Cornell or social security number, and we see that being sent out, DLP will look at it, make sure there's um, no, make sure there's less than three identifiers. If there's less, it will go out. If there are three identifiers or more, it will go back to the recipient. And then all other email, including encrypted email, goes straight to the internet. So when it does identify an exact match, DLP will stop the email from being um, sent out and it will notify the sender that Wall Cornell policy has been violated and that the sender needs to verify the recipient is authorized and intended to view the email. So if the sender believes that who they were sending to is authorized to view this information, then you would go back and encrypt the email before sending it out this time. So you can encrypt the email by typing in hashtag encrypt of the subject line before sending an email out. So a cool little tip that we actually saw from the IRB and we recently sent out um, in our tip up about how to create a quick step in Outlook is that you can actually create a quick step to encrypt an email for you. So if you're about to send an email and you know you're going to be sending sensitive information, you click on your quick step for hashtag encrypt and then an email will come up with the hashtag encrypt at the beginning of the subject line and you can continue the rest of your email. So other things to keep in mind when sending emails uh, that might have sensitive information in them is any PHI and PII that must be sent to an external recipient must be properly safeguarded. So it needs to be encrypted. If you do encrypt the email, uh, the external recipient has one month to click and view message attachments. They will also log into a secure email system with, an, with their email and password to view and reply to this email thread. And you will see receive a receipt once they read the email. Um, you must put hashtag encrypt into the subject line with each reply with the external recipient to, to maintain the encryption. Um, you also should double check that whoever you're sending this to is actually authorized to view the data before you hit send. Any PHI that's shared with a vendor, associate, or consultant um, on behalf of Wall Cornell should have a BAA in place with our privacy office. And as I mentioned, to send any high-risk data um, to an external address, use hashtag encrypt um, in the subject of the message. And if you are communicating with patients, Wall Cornell Connect or my chart should be the method used. Some other things to keep in mind when you're sending email, um, high-risk data sent to internal recipients or affiliates is actually encrypted. So anything sent to NYP users, MSKCC, Rockefeller, HSS is actually encrypted if you're sending to their work or school email. Um, if you need to send anything higher than 25 megabytes, you can use the file transfer service at transfer.while. So this will also provide a secure way to send attachments that are too large to send via hashtag encrypt. Um, it only encrypts attachments 
So no confidential data should be referenced in the message subject line or body when you're using file transfer service. And file transfer service works for both internal and external recipients. So something to keep in mind when you're using email, use your Wealth Cornell provided email address for any work or school correspondence uh, that you're doing. Don't forward any emails outside of Wall Cornell that are sent to your email Wall Cornell that are sent to your Wall Cornell email address and don't create any rules to do so. And don't let anyone else use your email address or log into your email address as it's supposed to be for you and contains your information. Before you hit send, make sure the people you're sending to are valid and authorized to view whatever you're send you're sending. Also double check that whatever you're sending doesn't have any inherent sensitive data if um you're replying to something, there are people on there that shouldn't see the reply and double check whether or not you should be using encryption. Again, as I mentioned, for patient communications, you really should use Walt Cornell Connect. And if you don't recognize an email or believe it to be phishing, report it to us via phish alarm, or you can also email spam at med.cornell.edu. Delete the message from your inbox. Don't click any links. Don't open any suspicious attachments. Um, or reply back. And if you report it to Fish Alarm, wait for us to respond to you before you do anything else. So that's a lot on email phishing, but there are other ways that your credentials can be stolen. So one is vishing. Vishing stands for voice, voice phishing. And this is when um, hackers target you via phone call. I'm not sure if some of you saw, but we actually um, participated in Vishing Awareness Week here at ITS recently. Uh, it was April 10th to April 14th to try to spread awareness about vishing, uh, given that vishing, vishing, and other types of vishing are becoming so common. So vishing uh, can spoof ID caller name and area codes through voice over internet protocol, which, they, which um, is VoIP. So they can try to pretend to be government entities. They can use the area code in which you live and spoof a phone number to make you think it's a friend or neighbor. And they can use this um, with VoIP, which is a technology that allows you to make voice calls using a broadband, broadband internet connection instead of regular analog phone lines. So VoIP easily allows um, identities and numbers to be spoofed. So hackers can pretend to be someone else. Um, this is typically why victims are often told that suspicious activity is taking place in one of their accounts or that they're entitled to a tax payment or special offer, given that the hackers try to um, try to impersonate government entities or banks. So like phishing, you're asked to provide personal information or perform an action. So they'll ask you to give them your password, make a bank transfer or something like that. Unlike phishing, they need you to do something in order to be successful, not mindlessly click a link or open an attachment, but you need to actually provide them with information or perform an action or authorization for phishing to be successful. It can also be more effective than other methods because people tend to let their guard down when they're talking to someone as opposed to just responding to a message or things online. Attackers often must call users manually and individually. So since less technology is involved, less hacking or IT knowledge is needed to perform these attacks. So more people can perform these attacks um, that are needed to carry out the more complicated methods used in um, phishing. And also phishing is difficult for authorities to detect because when it occurs over VoIP, um, it's often outsourced to other countries and the country's own law enforcement agencies may be powerless in many cases. So there's a few different types of phishing, um, one being hybrid phishing. So hybrid phishing is a combination of both phishing and phishing. So the hacker will typically send an email with a message and then also call you with the same message. So it might not be word for word, but the intent of the message is the same. So they may send you an email saying they're from your bank and they need you to confirm some information. And then they may call you also pretending to be from the same bank asking you to confirm the same information. So given that it's from two different methods, people tend to trust the legitimacy and urgency more because one method or the other, people tend to assume it's phishing or phishing. But if it's coming from two different channels, people do tend to trust this a little bit more. There's also um, a type of phishing called call callback or response-based phishing. This is also called telephone-oriented attack delivery. So it also leverages email phishing or other types of um, email or other types of methods to engage with you. And basically they would send you an email saying, oh, this is ITS tech support. We need you to call us back at X number. So they just use another method of phishing 
but they want you to call them back. And since you're the one calling them back, most people get a little bit more confident because they think they're more in control since they are the one doing the calling as opposed to receiving a call. So once the call would be made, you would actually be talking to the hacker and not whoever they're pretending to be. And then they would ask you for information like a bank account or a password, and they would use this to steal your credentials or whatever type of information they were trying to steal. Robocalls um, are a little bit less sophisticated, but can um, reach a larger audience. So this is sometimes called war dialing, where hackers would record an urgent or threatening message that they can send to tons and tons of recipients to make their net a little bit wider when they're going after users. So this message indicates um, that the user should call back at a different number. And if the user calls that number, they will be face to face uh, with the hacker and the hacker will engage in social engineering techniques to try to get them to disclose personal information. Last is spear phishing. So very similar to spear phishing, it's when hackers do research on their target before actually uh, engaging with them. So one really common phishing attempt that was happening right when COVID started was a phishing attempt for VPN access. So hackers would go on LinkedIn or Facebook to see who was starting new jobs remotely and then they would call them pretending to be their tech support and get them set up with VPN. So they'd screen share, have the person get set up with VPN, and then they actually use those credentials to get into the person's VPN themselves after they pretended to be the person's um, company support. So there's a few common themes for phishing schemes. One is bank impersonation, like I mentioned. So they call pretending to be the employee of your bank, asking you to confirm your bank account number, perform a transaction, or verify any other personal information. A lot of times they use hybrid vishing or callback vishing for these attempts just to make it seem more legitimate. Another is romance scam. So if you've seen the Tindler Swindler, uh, this is a vishing romance scam that was carried out where um, a man had a lot of money sent to him by various women. Uh, and this is what romance scams are when the hacker sets up a fake dating profile and tries to start a relationship with uh, the target. And they make grand gestures and claim uh, to be very close with the victim, all in order to try to get the victim to send money, especially since they're calling them on the phone. They pretend to be a real person by trying to have people let their guard down by calling them on the phone. The next uh, type of common scam is loaner investment offers. So they'll try to um, get you to invest or have a quick fix to pay off your debts. And they use this urgency to try to get you to agree quickly to engaging in um, their once in a lifetime scams. The last one uh, that's a common theme for vishing is Medicare or social security scams. So frequently uh, Medicare numbers or bank account details are requested with these scams. The scammers pretend to be Medicare or social security offices and they sometimes spoof uh, the numbers that they're using to call you and they try to get your Medicare information, social security numbers, or any other information that could help them steal your accounts. So to protect yourself from vishing, there's a few different things to keep in mind. So ignore phone calls from unfamiliar numbers. Instead, let it go to voicemail and then listen to the voicemail to determine whether or not it's a good idea to call the person back. And if you do call the person back, make sure you verify their identity before moving forward with the call. Remember they can spoof numbers. So even if a call is from someone in your area code that you don't know, it might not be legitimate. Also, if you're on a call that you suspect is vishing, hang up immediately and block the number. Avoid pressing any keys or providing a voice response to an automated message. Because if you do, they might be reporting, recording the call and then they might actually use your affirmatives, yes, no's, or whatever you say to call your bank and then use your voice to carry out uh, fraudulent actions and try to take money from your accounts. So pay close attention to the caller's language and know if they're using social engineering tactics that prey on fear, urgency, or once in a lifetime opportunities. And you can also enroll in the do not call registry. If you enroll in that registry, then no legitimate telemarketers are going to call you. So if you enroll in this registry, it can help you learn if numbers are fished by if you're getting a call from an unknown number um, that's trying to sell you something or promise you something, then you know it's most likely a fish. And never provide your phone number and emails or messages that request it. Treat it like sensitive information so it does not get out there. And keep in mind, no federal agency or trustworthy company will ever ask you for private data unless you requested it. 
So very similar to vishing um, is smishing. So this attack uses SMS text messaging, which SMS is short messaging service. So it's a popular test-based messaging service, uh, which nearly all cell phone uh, providers support. So the biggest problem from a security perspective is that SMS senders are not authenticated beyond attached phone number. So as long as someone knows your phone number, they can send you an SMS message. And although it's a little bit harder, SMS messages um, can be created through apps that can help hackers mask their original phone number, similar to vishing with spoofing. Uh, there are apps that can help create fake phone numbers to send you SMS messages from. So typical scams include clicking a link um, or providing personal information. They also might try to get you to download malware um, on your phone so they can steal any information that's on your phone. They typically impersonate large well-known organizations such as UPS, FedEx, Google, the IRS, Wells Fargo, Amazon, PayPal, and different um, accounts like that. So one of the issues too with smishing um, that's a little bit different than phishing is if they do send you a URL, you can't hover over it. So it's a lot more difficult to tell if the URL they're sending you is actually what you're going to be led to. So it's definitely important to be very, very careful with any links that you click and any text messages you receive. So some common smishing schemes um, have to do with the IRS, as you can see on the upper right here, they may pretend to be the IRS asking you to confirm information, saying that you owe more money and threatening you, or that you're gonna get more money than you paid and trying to entice your curiosity um, and want to receive the prize to respond to them. There's also a fake order invoice scheme uh, that's pretty common. So they'll send you a message with your tracking number, telling you they have an update on your order, or claim that something's wrong with your payment and they need you to click a link. And there's a much more sophisticated version of this scheme that's been starting with, with a series of fake order messages. So they'll send you the first message saying your order's confirmed. Then they'll send you another message with a discount code, then another message saying that your order has been successfully completed or any other updates on your order, which if you look at um, the messages in the middle there, that's uh, one of these schemes. Another pretty common scheme is the fake Google or Apple verification. So they'll reach out to you pretending to Google, Google or Apple and say that they need to verify your phone number. And then a pretty common scheme uh, for smishing, also seen in phishing and vishing, is a fake prize, gift card, or special offer um, contest scam. So similar to phishing and vishing, they will send you a, um, a text saying that you've won a prize, needs to be claimed, and they'll ask for information or for a response from you, as you can see in the lower right here. And then the last really common submission scheme is a payroll or banking update. So they'll pretend to be your bank or your company asking you to update your payment information or that you may be locked out of your account or not receive your salary. So there are a few different things you can do to protect yourself from smishing. So never send credit card numbers, ATM pins, or banking information to someone in text messages. It's not secure and it's not a good idea. Your financial institution also will never send a text asking for your credentials or a transfer of money. As in vishing, avoid responding to a phone number that you don't recognize. Also as in phishing and vishing, look at the tone, look at the sender and see if you could confirm the sender's identity another way or go directly to the support website instead of actually clicking any links or responding to um, the message sent to you. Also avoid storing banking information on your smartphone because if you do end up falling for a smishing scam and malware is um, downloaded, then the hackers can get into your banking information. If you suspect a message you've received is smishing, report it to your wireless provider, the FCC or the FTC. You can also send um, any suspicious spam messages to 7726, which actually sells, spells out spam, if your carrier is AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, or Verizon. So how to protect yourself from submission continued. Like I mentioned, don't click any links or respond to any contact information in the text, because even if you send something like stop or unsubscribe, they're checking for active phone numbers. So they might try to reach out to you again with a different smishing scheme. But if you don't respond, they won't know if your phone number is active or worth their time. Messages received from a number with only a few digits probably came from an email address, which is a sign that it's spam. So if it's an odd looking phone number, such as a four digit one, it can be evidence of them using an email to text service. And this is one of many tax tactics that they use um, to try to carry out their smishing attacks. 
So an exposed password may still be useless to smishing attackers if you have MFA installed. So using MFA is a really good way to protect yourself, even if you've already fallen for a smishing attack. And a lot of MFA providers, such as what we use Duo, actually has you authenticate via the app instead of using SMS messaging to authenticate. You could also download an anti-malware app to your phone to help protect to help protect against smishing. And you can also keep your operating system up to date, which will inherently protect against malware. The last thing you could do is set up a spam filter on your phone. Not all phones support this, such as some Android zone of filtering, but you can uh, download certain apps that can help you with spam filtering and your providers um, should have more information on how to set up these filters. And I do have links to the majority of providers on how to set up spam filtering on different um, phones. So another way that hackers can try to fish you is social media or instant messaging phishing. So they can try to fish you through social media channels such as Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and WhatsApp. So especially uh, with LinkedIn, hackers will try to reach out and pretend um, to be someone you trust. And given the amount of information that's LinkedIn, so on LinkedIn, such as um, where people live, where they work, hackers love using LinkedIn to carry out their scams or even just gather information about you. So once they, they either create a fake account and try to pose as someone you trust or try to pretend to be someone that you would trust, or if they compromise one of your friend's accounts, they will try to reach out to you through your friend's account and hope that since it's your friend, you will trust them and go through with whatever scam they're trying to carry out. Um, this screenshot in the bottom right shows a Facebook scam that happened a little while ago where um, a Facebook account was hacked. They sent out a photo and when someone clicked on the link, it took them to a YouTube website that said they needed to install uh, two Chrome extensions in order to view the photo or video. And then once they installed those extensions, those extensions allowed malware to be installed on the user's PCs. And some of these users ended up uh, having their computers locked and having to um, pay, ransom, pay a fee in order to get the ransomware off their computer. So similar to uh, phishing, vishing, and smishing, use those same tactics. Look at the sender. If it's someone you don't know, beware of it. Beware of it. Even if it is someone you do know, be careful. I remember one time I received a Facebook message from someone pretending to be my father and just the language they were using, I knew it wasn't him. So even if you get a message from someone you know or you think you know, really look at the language and what they're asking you to do to see if it's actually that person. And then report any of these attempts to the app or channel support. So Facebook, Instagram, all of them have different um, ways that you can report spam or phishing attempts. So please utilize those. Another thing um, that hackers have been using is support scams. So they've been using something called Angular phishing. So Angular phishing is depicted on the right over here with PayPal. So attackers will imitate a customer service agent on social media to try to get you to provide them information. So if they see a post about um, someone being angry about PayPal or say they see someone angry at Grubhub for not refunding them for a meal, they'll create a fake account pretending to be PayPal or Grubhub and then reach out to you asking you to confirm information or sending you a link claiming that if you click the link, you'll get what you want, but it's actually a phishing attempt. So they use all forms of phishing, phishing or smishing for uh, these scams. Angular phishing is just one kind of scam that they use. And they may even use a combination of more than one of these methods in order to get you to believe the legitimacy of these attempts. So they may ask you to download screen sharing software so they, they can help you. Um, as with other forms of phishing, verify their identity, identity before proceeding with anything. And when in doubt, disengage. Go straight to the support website if you fear that who you're talking to may not actually be someone trying to help you. Um, as I mentioned, they're going to use a lot of different channels to try to carry out these attacks. On the right here, they used a legitimate PayPal interaction, but they put contact us at 188-713-7321 in the actual transaction details. So this was not PayPal's actual support number. They put in their own number that they want the user to call in the transaction details to try to trick the user into calling this number as opposed to going to actual PayPal support. And then one of the last uh, social engineering scams that we see is MFA fatigue. So like I mentioned before, multi-factor authentication can really help you secure your accounts, but hackers can also use this to try to wear you down and get access to your accounts. So MFA fatigue is an attack when a threat actor will run a script that attempts to log into your, 
to log into your account with stolen credentials over and over. So if you've already been phished or if um, your credentials have already been leaked in some manner, they will send you multiple MFA pushes, phone calls, whatever it may be, to try to annoy you into hitting accept. So they think if they wear you out that you'll accept and then they can get into your account. So even though these phishing attempts, even though these pushes and prompts may be annoying, don't authorize any MFA pushes, prompts, phone calls that you didn't actually initiate yourself. Um, this, this attack has been used to compromise employee accounts at Uber, Microsoft, and Cisco. Um, so a good thing you can do is to check the location of where these accounts are coming from if it's a duo push um, and never accept any duo pushes or calls that you did not generate. You can also report any fraudulent or suspicious duo pushes to ITS and please do so if you receive a duo push that you did not initiate. So be careful when you get pushes that you don't remember initiating, especially if they keep coming in over and over again and you didn't initiate them. So a few more cybersecurity tips to keep you safe. Some of these I've touched on in the presentation. Some of them are just good to keep in mind. Always use strong passwords. Um, I know we have a password policy here at Wall Cornell that mandates strong passwords, but keep this in mind when you're making passwords on other websites and don't, don't reuse passwords, especially your Wall Cornell password. Don't use it for anything else because if your password gets compromised on a less secure website, hackers may try to use your password on other websites in order to get into other data. Always encrypt your lock sensitive data and never leave your device in a public place or anywhere it can be easily stolen. So keep an eye on your laptops and smartphones when you're out and about and even when you leave your home. Only use apps available in your device's app store and never download them from a browser. These apps might be unsafe if they're not from the app store and not trusted. And watch out for new apps from unknown, unknown developers that have limited or bad reviews. Keeping your apps updated is another good way to protect against um, any hackers stealing your credentials. And also, if they're no longer support, supported by the App Store, delete them. Don't keep using them if they no longer receive updates from whomever created them. Be careful of what you put on your social media. Um, as I mentioned with social media phishing, hackers can gain information about you to pretend like they know you if you put too much social, too much information on your social media. And also too, a lot of the times we use things about us to create our passwords. So if you use your partner's name or your pet's name or your birth date in your password it's on your social media, chances are hackers are gonna to try to use that information to guess your password. As I mentioned a few times throughout this presentation, think before you click on any links or open any attachments in any sort of message you receive, whether it be text, email, or social media messages. If you don't know a number, let it go to voicemail and then really listen to the voicemail to see if it's actually something you should call back. And if you don't, if you're on the fence and don't know, go straight to um, whoever was calling you, whether it be a support website, the government, your friend or family member, try to contact them through another means instead of just going and calling the number back. Turn off your Wi-Fi when you aren't using it or you don't need it. Don't allow your device to auto join Wi-Fi networks, especially public networks that don't have passwords. And don't send sensitive information over Wi-Fi unless you know for a fact it's secure. So don't do any banking when you're at Starbucks using their public network. If you're able to, disable automatic Bluetooth pairing and always turn off Bluetooth when it's not needed. And lastly, never save your login information when you're using a web browser, especially when you're on a public um, computer or um, a device that you don't own. So that is kind of the last of my tips and content for today. So I have a few resources um, that Vanessa will send out after the meeting to help you guys um, out and if you have further questions. So we've got some helpful links about phishing, how to report it to ITS and a little bit more about our phishing alarm. Also some helpful links for phishing and smishing, the link to the do not call registry, our phishing awareness week information that we sent out and then T-Mobile, Sprint and AT&T, how to report smishing and phishing to them. I also have some links for Verizon on how to report uh, spam messages to them and iPhone and Google Voice, how to set up those spam filters so you can try to filter out some phishing and phishing attempts. I also have some links about encrypting email, so how to encrypt it, more about our hashtag encrypt service and our file transfer service and how to reset um, an external user's password if they're having issues getting into transfer.wild. 
I also have a link to our tip up homepage because our quick step tip up is up there right now and hashtag encrypt is part of that tip up. And we have a separate article to show you how to use um, quick, step quick step specifically to set up hashtag encrypt. I also have a link to our use of email policy and uh, a link to the tip up itself. Lastly, for the resources that I have, I have a link to the IC3 if you want to learn more about the report that they have or if you need to file a complaint with them, and some links to the FCC and FTC to file any complaints uh, that you have with them. Last but not least, I have my contact information. So my seaweed is ALS2079. So you can email me with any questions that you have, whether it be about anything I went over today, anything cybersecurity or ITS related. And then I also have the distribution list for my team. So if you have some security questions that you want to reach out to us as well, or any security concerns, you could reach out to us there. So I think we have about nine minutes left, and that's all of the content that I had. So does anyone have any questions? Um, actually, we have Brian answering some in the chat. But for those who aren't following, um, Fred asked what malware apps are recommended, and Brian has listed several. If you, it, I'll send this to everyone as well in the follow-up email, um, but he suggested Microsoft Defender, which works on apps other than Windows, uh, Norton, McAfee, uh, Avast, AVG, and Lookout are all good choices that come with some free features. Um, but he does recommend that the, the best protection is to keep your operating system up to date. So when you see those system updates, uh, you know, notifications on your computer, please go ahead and actually update your computer to make sure that you are getting all of uh, the latest security features installed on your device as well. Again, I'll be sending those um, application recommendations um, in the follow-up email. And uh, Joel asked, how often should you change your personal email password? And Brian recommends um, not to change your passwords unless they were compromised or suspected to be compromised. Um, it's much better to use a stronger uh, passphrase, uh, which we do have a video about creating strong passphrases. So I'll be sure to include that in the follow-up email as well. Um, you can also use a password manager and multi-factor uh, authentication, which Ali uh, mentioned in her presentation. And, uh, you know, we do offer LastPass at Wild Cornell, so I can send uh, links to that. So if you're interested in setting up a password manager account, um, you can certainly do so with a tool like LastPass. Um, those are all the questions. If there are any more, um, you know, feel free to post them in the chat or the Q&A. I don't see any other ones. Um, so I'll just wait a little bit. Uh, and if not, we can just wrap up. But thanks, Ali, so much for all this information. Um, again, Ali listed some great resources. I'm going to send the entire PowerPoint to everybody. So you have all of the tips, all of the resources that are listed at the end. Um, and I'll maybe try to highlight some in the body of the email, like um, the tip ups and some of the videos um, that Ali mentioned about uh, fish alarm and things like that. So um, those are kind of front and center, and you can always uh, take a look at those when you need to. Uh, but it looks like no more questions. So Allie and Brian, thank you so much for providing this information. Um, and thank you to everyone who was able to join today. We really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about uh, protecting your information online. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for having us, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone.